Hi, everybody. Hi, Jackie and Annette and Dawn and Shelly. Wonderful to see you guys. Diane, love this. Thank you guys for joining us this evening. I love this topic. I love this topic because I am going to be this topic. I, I, either it's going to be my left knee or my left hip, but I'm planning now. So it's bionic boomers, training after joint replacement. I'm not quite sure we all need joint replacements. We're going to talk about uh, talk about that. But the incident of joint replacement is high with over 1 million hip and knee replacement procedures. And I don't know if you've ever been to one of my workshops, but I'm always talking about like, well, you know, we're going to do this now because you've got to treat your joints and your ligaments and your tendons with respect. It's like your teeth. They're supposed to last you the rest of your life. Well, no longer. You can get your teeth replaced after I tripped and fell and knocked out this tooth. You can, I, you can get your knees, your hips, your shoulders replaced. So anyway, join our panel of experts as they cover the do's and don'ts of training clients who have undergone joint replacement. And it's really interesting. I got, I've got four great people with me. And Robert Linkle is the owner of trainingtheolderadult.com. It's a personal training studio and online continuing education provider for fitness professionals. Um, he's NSCA's 2012 Personal Trainer of the Year Award winner, and he's 2017 NSCA Fellowship inductee. So this is kind of cool. And then we've got Matt Sagawa. He is a BS in kinesiology and exercise science. Um, he's an ACE health coach. Um, NSCA, CSCS, ACS, I feel like I should just go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, <laughs> clinical exercise physiologist. He's the fitness manager for Lifestart. And I asked him what Lifestart Wellness Network was. And it's actually a pretty big company that deals with corporate sites. And right now he manages several, one site that deals with several corporations, right, Matt? Correct. Right. So he gets a great variety of people. And Kim Miller, I've known for how many years? I think 10 years. I think at least 10 years. And yeah, maybe longer now. Yeah. Yeah. And she's the CEO of Healing with Excellence. She's got over 20 years experience in health and fitness. She holds nine national certifications. She's a level three neurokinetic practitioner and I'm going to try to do this ego skew posture analysis and holistic health coach. Did I do okay. That's good. You're good. <laughs> I did. Okay. Yeah, really don't humiliate the host. All right. <laughs> Chris Gellert. Um, he's got a whole bunch of things after his name, but we just call him Chris. He's a licensed <laughs> physical therapist. He's a personal trainer. He's a national presenter and author. He's president of Pinnacle Training and Consulting. God, this you guys are like impressive. Um, and he focuses on evidence-based material. And what I was very interested in in this um, webinar was, it seems like every class I teach, somebody in that class, somebody in that small group training session has had something replaced, had something repaired, and is looking towards a future of, do you think I'm gonna need a replacement? How am I gonna respond afterwards? Or I'm preparing for something and it's real. And we come across this all the time, all the time. Now, just so you guys know, we have about, uh, we've got over a hundred people registered for this webinar. And a lot of people just go and listen to the recordings. We love it. I understand we're all busy and we're a little bit zoomed out, but you guys are here live. So move your mouse, go to the bottom of your screen. You're going to see the green screen share button there. Don't click it. That's it. I'm the only one who can do that. Go to the chat box. And I love this. Please click on the chat box. It's to the left of the share screen. Type in where you're from. I want, we want to make sure that if you have questions, we answer them. And I didn't, I keep forgetting to introduce myself. I'm Sarah Cooperman. I'm the CEO of SCW Fitness Education. And we have Adam Budakavali with us tonight, who's one of our lead designers, does our wonderful emails and the designs for all the webinars. He's a 
Plus, he's really funny. So we love him. Um, he's helping us run this webinar tonight. So I love this. Raleigh, North Carolina, Jackie from Alabama, New York, New Jersey. Hilarious, actually. Thank you, Adam. That was lovely. Diane from Somerville, Massachusetts. I've got someone from Brompton, Ontario, Canada, Maryland. I love this. All right. So we're going to start out. What should I include or look for in a client's initial assessment or post-op? And Robert, I'm going to start with you on this lovely question. Well, we're, we're definitely not wanting to step outside of our scope of practice. So we are going to go talk to our clients with their permission, of course, talk to our, our client's doctor, physical therapist. Ideally, um, not, not everybody goes to PT after surgery. Ideally, they would. And they would get released from PT prior to coming to us. And we would try to connect with that team and make sure that um, we're all on the same page. You know, what movements they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing how well their, their physical therapy is progressing, if they're ready to, to come in with limited or no restrictions, or if there's still things that we're looking for uh, to improve, physical therapy is gonna see them again, but start to spread out their sessions. We, we want all that information. And uh, we'd also like to be able to get some kind of general assessment of where they currently are, um, kind of bringing them in for that, you know, the first or second session. Um, it's very much so a team approach. We just go diving right into this not really knowing what they're capable of or where they're at, um, we're, we're likely to have some injuries or have some negative returns. So we definitely want to make sure we're, we're up to date and uh, have as much information as we can to, to kind of progress with them from there. And I like to hear that. And I like to hear the team approach. The one thing I have to mention, Dan is from Waikiki. That's totally, it's much cooler than Seattle, Washington. Okay, I'm just saying. But we've got... You know, you bring this up and we didn't talk, we, we mentioned this, you had mentioned this before we turned the camera on, but what I didn't ask you was how do you, how do you connect with the physician? How do you connect with the physical therapist? How much time does that take? And do you do like a group Zoom call? And, you know, I can imagine the emails and trying to get through sometimes the nurses or the front desk staff. How do you make it happen? Um, it all has to come from the patient, to be honest, because you, you have to have all their permission to be able to do so. They need to connect the dots and, and kind of hook us up. And in most cases, I'm not actually getting a face to face with the doctor, or even a phone call with the doctor. I'm, I'm getting uh, either one of their, their assistants um, or just an email that says, you know, don't do this, do this. And, you know, they've been released to PT and they're good. Um, but I like to cross, you know, those T's and dot those I's just to make sure everything is good. If I have a client that I'm concerned with or I'm seeing something that doesn't quite look right, I'll even go back and ask the doctor, you know, you're sure we're good. Like I have permission to work with this individual and, and move forward from there. Physical therapists are much easier and much more willing. Even now, I mean, we've seen this, Chris and Matt and, and Kim, you guys probably talked to it a little bit, but I'd say in the last like six years, it seems like people have become a lot more understanding in the idea of, of personal trainers and physios working together where before we were at odds and we were like, we're going to lose clients if we refer and we talk to them. Um, you know, we, I've given presentations in the past and people are like, this will never work now in the last five years. I really think it does. People are very willing to share that information. They want the client to do well. They understand that working together is, is going to be the best approach. So yeah, I think connecting dots from them is, is a very good way to start. It all starts with the client. And I think you're right. And I think what's really interesting, and we've seen this huge growth in telehealth, which mm -hmm. kind of tends to loosen some of the barriers as far as being able to communicate. Um, the other thing I see is that, okay, I, I've talked before that I've had multiple knee surgeries and um, my doctors push me. They want me to be you know, they have great knee surgery because if I'm back in, I'm going to recommend the physician. Now, and the reality is the guy, you know, stitched me up and I'm going to see you or Kim or, say, you know, I'm going to go see somebody and it's their reputation that you're helping with. And I hope that there's a realization there. Chris, you are a physical therapist, but you also do personal training. So yeah. do you see this bridging of the gap and, a, and an increase in communications? Yeah, and actually just to piggyback what Rob said, I am both a physio and a personal trainer. I've been a trainer for 20 years. I speak at conferences. I speak internationally as well. 
you know, the thing about what Rob said, he nailed it, is that you have to empower the client or the patient to say, listen, give them a call because you know what? I'll be honest with two things. Physical therapists are busy, busy. We're overworked, not like anyone else overworked, but we're, we're seeing all these numbers and it's basically trying to cram patients in sometimes to some practices and others, it's actually the quality care. They're not getting hands-on and the hands-on is so important as you know, Sarah, with your injury. So number two, is that the ignorance, there is ignorance in our profession still, Rob nailed it, that physical therapists, men, the male therapists are like, you know, I don't need to talk to him. And I've talked to my colleagues and it's like, listen, change that mindset, like what Kim said, change your mindset and talk with the physical therapist and talk with the personal trainer and get everyone on the same page. So I think there's a lot, you know, really Rob said it clearly, within the last five to six years, we're seeing a shift I think from west to east, when I was in Australia doing my postgrad physio, they're, they're like bread and butter. They are together. They're like, a, I call it the rehab triangle. You've got, your, you've got your therapist, you've got your client, and you've got your actually, you know, the personal trainer, the movement specialist there too. So I think that we need to empower and promote more of this relationship building now. I really do. I think it's a huge point. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's great. And how are we going to integrate um, <laughs> these people into, let's say, a group fitness class or into the small group training. Um, Kimberly, what are your suggestions here? Well, for me, and I think probably all the trainers here, we always look for variations of the exercise and we get to know the clients, even though they're in a group fitness setting. And so if we know someone's had a hip replacement or knee replacement, we might proactively tell them, hey, these couple of exercises are going to be in the program. I need you to adjust one of these. Or we might demonstrate, you know, something that would be a digress or this would be progressing. So really just making sure the client's doing what they can do. But for me, and I know some of you have had this, I might have had a client come to me that's 82 years old, had a shoulder replacement, hip replacement. And I remember she was one of my first clients 20 years ago. And she said, do not treat me like I'm 80. And she was so tired of being held back with her fitness. So I really pay attention to where is the person at? What, what is their physiological load? What was her history with exercise? And where is their mindset? And make sure that I'm not holding them back at the same time, helping them propel forward. And that's wonderful to hear because I've gone into, um, <clears throat> excuse me, physical therapy after my meniscus tear. And mm -hmm you know, on a piece of paper, oh, look, she's a 62 year old woman from the suburbs. You know what? <laughs> I will kick your gluteals. If you ever, you know, you know, I'm like, bring it on. Well, I was, I felt like I was almost crippled the next day because I really <laughs> pushed, but you, I think as a, as fitness professionals, all of us on this call, sometimes we get to connect more with the person and we're not just dealing with a piece of paper and a protocol and this is what we do. So that gives us a lot of freedom. And Matt, you get a wide variety of people, don't you, that you work with at your yes. facility. And how do you manage all those different individuals? Um, kind of coming off of what uh, Kim was saying, that the idea is to not really just treat the diagnosis that you might see, on the doctor's note, but to work with the person and where, where they are at. Because again, people are at different stages of their, their rehab process. Some people are really scared to do activities. Some people are really gung-ho and are ready to dive right into the workouts. So as long as you're willing to come to their level and work with them in this process, I think that's one of the best approaches because there's not really a, like a cookie cutter like protocol we can follow. Yes, we can kind of pick the guidelines and follow those uh, initially, but we need to connect with that person on that one-to-one -one level and see where they're at so we can adjust from there, whether it's progressing or regressing in the class or the training session. And what are some of those progressions and regressions that you can do? I think before we turn the camera on, I think Chris, it was you that talked about just reducing basically the, the depth of a squat if you're dealing with a hip replacement. Yeah, I think, I think you know, Rob said it earlier off camera, you know, hinging and unloading. I think that if we can think about unloading where we're not putting load through a weight-bearing joint, 
that's going to really help the total hip. Uh, from a total knee perspective, you know, I can't, I, I've got Mr. Knee here and I just, cause I had a meniscal injury too, Sarah, and mine was slipping on ice and, and not to say what caused yours, but mine was stupid that I stopped squatting. No, my, I stopped squatting and I stopped squatting heavy, but now what I do is I'm doing dumbbells and doing a lot of lunges because I'm reducing the load. So I'm reducing the load force from top down and my knee is doing really well. I stopped doing, you know, barbell squats. I stopped doing hack squats. I've stopped doing, you know, all this excessive loading and I want my knee to age gracefully. So I think the bigger picture is you're, mon you're monitoring what the patient can do, what the other panels have said, but you're looking at what is the forces on the joint and around that we need to address. And then most importantly, stretch the tight strength in the week. So hip flexors typically are really tight. I can't think of anyone, uh, you know, in, in my career that I said, Sarah, I want you to do hip flexor strength. You know, it's a stabilizer, but I'm working that posterior chain particularly and why I'm working it because it's weaker and it does need for sit to stand for functional use for walking, maybe getting back to some light jogging. But with a knee replacement, if they ask me, do I get back to running? I'm going to be like, your running days are over. I'll be very direct with them because the more you start to go back and say, yes, they're going to go, my therapist said so, and they hurt their knee again. It's me on the, on the chopping block, just like any other panelist, but it's science that no knee should have to go back to doing that again from a replacement point of view. And that's, that's pretty interesting because my chiropractor was the one who's like, stop it, stop running, just stop it. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to gain weight. Oh my God. La, la, la. I'm like, yeah, I just, I walk my dog. I talk to people on the phone and I, I get a, it's a great workout and it does work well. So that's good. That's actually very nice to hear. Um, when you were taught, I'm going to jump a little bit. You talked about the posterior chain. Um, I'm going to jump to Robert. Can you explain a little bit about what exercises we want to do and why to focus on the posterior chain? Yeah, posterior chain is uh, probably our greatest priority. Number one, we're looking at older populations. So the amount of work that they're going to put in, um, gravity is just pulling on them. Shoulders are coming forward. The head's coming forward. They're kyphotic. Their hip flexors are tied, just as Chris is mentioning. Like everything's folded on them. So if we're able to work on their extensors, their glutes, their rhomboids, start to train the basically the backside of the body that's going to help prop them up more, keep them a little bit more upright, and start to introduce some transfers and some loaded carries, suitcase, farmer carries, zercher carries, different loads. These are going to allow you to manipulate load in like a daily life movement pattern. They're carrying their groceries, they're walking their dog, they're doing all kinds of different actions, but also really encourage and strengthen the musculatures that we need. So some things you want to think about with the joint replacements. This is why like, I've had both of my hips replaced. I, I had a, a dislocation of my left one and I needed a complete revision. So technically I've had three hip replacements. And the second you wake up, they're like, as soon as you can stand and start walking, we got to do that. What we're looking to do is basically compact and like push the joint together under your load with gravity to get all that to, to adhere and stay together. And basically the metal starts to graft into the bone. So if we deload or unload or lay in bed for days, it'll refuse, it'll start to push it out. So you need to add load, but we got to do it wisely in smart ways. Just like Chris is talking, we're not going to do direct overhead squats or back squats, but we still need to flex at the hip, flex at the knee. We need to load it. We need to introduce overload. And that's going to start to dense up the bone and build the musculature around it. So we're not trying to avoid any of those actions. We're trying to uh, manipulate and select a different variation that's going to allow us to have the result we want without inflaming the joint, aggravating the joint, damaging the joint. So we're going to start to make really good improvements there. And a lot of that has to start with that posterior chain, which is just basically going to be weak on almost anybody through the aging process, unless they've been strength training, you know, for a big chunk of their life. But that's a big target for us, for sure. Um, Kimberly, what's your, what are your thoughts on the posterior chain? And I, you know, I always bring this up. You always look at the whole person. You mm -hmm. always look at the whole person. And how does that influence the way you train somebody? Yeah, it's really, I mean, of course, the posterior chain is key. And I'm also going to look for any areas of excessive tightness. So after surgery, you might have excessive tightness in the calf muscle or quads, 
or maybe in the glute medius and try to teach them ways to do some soft tissue re release to help reduce compression of the joint because just because it's now uh, a replacement doesn't mean you can't still create pain in the area. So I'm looking at how everything that's supporting the joint is doing. And we talked about earlier off camera, looking at making sure the routine matches uh, their posture to help create the best posture. So if they are kyphotic, making sure we're doing maybe some standing cable roll, rows. When they're doing that, as long as they're at that point of their healing process, they're also creating stability in the joint, in the hip and the knee, if they're having to stand and do those standing cable rows. So we're working on the stabilizers, we're working on the prime movers that are gonna keep them upright. But I also look at their exercise programming being effective for their everyday life. So I don't want them walking 10 miles to nowhere if it's going to increase their joint pain and then they can't cut up vegetables to cook at night or they can't go to the grocery store without pain. So when I look at the training program, whether they're with me or on their off days, I'm always thinking about making sure their at home quality of life is excellent because if their mental health declines because they can't get in and out of their car or they can't go to the grocery store, they can't cook, and let's be honest, they can't be intimate. There's a lot of things that change in the home life after a major surgery. So I don't want them to kick ass in the gym and then be crippled at home and everything else decline in their quality of life. Oh, that's great advice. Um, Matt, what are some of the things you do with people that you see? Because it seems like you're, you might not see somebody coming to you specifically because they're post-op you know, or pre-op, they just might be there and share this with you. And then it's kind of like dumped on you. In a way, um, <laughs> that's half the fun, pretty much. Right? It keeps me on my toes. It keeps me sharp. But uh, it's similar to what other people have saying, I mean, I love the, the posterior chain approach just in general, whether you're pre-op, post-op, not even considering any kind of operation. Um, cause just general strength training, especially on that posterior chain, um, I think it's, it's a missing component. Uh, people kind of know what some of these exercises are, but not necessarily how to do them per se. Um, if it was as easy as just going through their motions, I think we would all be big buff and fit and functional, right? But there's, there's a little more to it besides just showing up to the gym and hopping on that row machine or the, the kickback machine, <laughs> but um, it's just a, a good strength training protocol, whether you're starting from, from scratch or progressing at an advanced level. Um, a lot of people, whether it's surgical or not, if people have aches and pains, they'll always be asking the question, man, what's a good stretch for my back? My back kind of hurts. But that kind of goes back to like the initial assessment. Like maybe you don't even need to be doing a stretch for that area that hurts. Maybe it needs strengthening. So if people do have questions like that, you have a panel of four or five people right here that you can ask to help set up some of those, those ideas and programs to get you started. So sure, can whether I it's the strength you? training or the, the mobility, um, always make sure to work on both. Yeah, um, Chris? I just want to jump in quick. I, I think for the audience and for the panel, and I don't mean to be dumbing it down, but I really have to say this. I think Matt hit a really good point, but I think also if someone's in pain, they need to rest in ice. They don't need to heat it up. They don't need to stretch it, but take that approach for the first three days, use that ice principle, kind of take it easy. They can do isometric exercises that they can learn from working with someone, either a physio or the fitness professional, then start to incomplete maybe heat and then do some stretching. But I think that the biggest thing about the industry is not knowing when to, and we should really teach using ice right after an injury. Go back to ice, resting it, and then kind of gradually phasing in soft tissue release or stretching accordingly. But don't jump into strengthening right away. Just because physiologically, the nociceptors are ticked off. They're, they're angry, right? We want to calm them down. So we want to do rest, ice, and just chill. I just want to make sure that that's communicated effectively. And that actually answers Rocky's question of, mm -hmm. I need a suggestion of how to help someone who's injured their hip flexor. Kim, and, and you responded, you know, there's, there's multiple ways to deal with these type of issues. And 
you use a neuromuscular kind of restoration approach. Um, I know you do the neurokinetics. Can you please explain that and share that? Because it's, it's good for us to look at different ways to treat. Yeah, and as you guys know, it depends on how that hip flexor was injured, but let's say it's strained. You definitely don't want to keep stretching it if it's already strained, but oftentimes the hip flexor is strained or tightening, tightening excessively because another muscle is not coming to the table. So I use a manual muscle testing to see if the glute is functioning, functioning correctly or make sure the quads are working. And if they're not, bring those supporting muscles to the table first and then work the supporting muscles around it. But also exactly what Chris says, sometimes don't work it at all. Sometimes we actually need to rest it. Like your chiropractor, like don't do it. We may need to rest and ice the hip flexor and give it a break. It all depends on you know where somebody's at in their process of healing. Are they an athlete? Who is it that we're training? But for me, if the glutes aren't coming to the table or the core is not working correctly, the hip flexors are gonna often be extremely tight or they're gonna end up with an injury. Interesting. Um, all right. And I want to ask this question because I want to make sure we address it. I want to know, and Robert, I'm starting with you, the, the, your biggest success story working with a joint replacement. I had a client who um, was a, a uh, national champion, masters, downhill skier, and uh, in the super G and the slalom. I don't, I don't know the sport all that well basically tons of impact on her knees and um, came to me. We started training. She continued to do well, won some more championships, was skiing and powder uh, at, at a, just a recreational event and um, hit a rock, hyperextended her knee on one side and on the other side, uh, landed on her knee, had a, a spider break of her patella and the unhappy triad, the uh, ACL, MCL and the medial meniscus all tore. Um, they re rebuilt her and uh, sent, sent her back into to rehab. Eventually, it was about two years in, they ended up doing a full knee replacement on her. Um, she has since then returned to skiing and has added to her championships. And so this is a very special individual in terms of her work ethic and how, you know, how much time she put in. Um, I spent countless hours with her more than any client I've ever worked with in the gym to help get her back to that level. Uh, and that's, I'm going to say that's not typical, Chris, I would probably defer to you in terms of, you know, having somebody go downhill ski after getting a knee replacement, but really felt like she had good years left in her and um, she was right. And so she's since then retired, but is still very capable and able and does hundred mile bike rides and climb Mount Rainier and, you know, does all these great things. So she's definitely my, my biggest success story. That's pretty amazing. So you worked with her after the first surgery, and then you worked with her again, to, and then you worked with her to prep her for the replacement, and then the recovery on the replacement, and you just continued to train her. 17 years. She was my first client. So. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. So it's been a long time. That's pretty cool. That's yeah. very cool. So tell me, should a knee replacement ski, Chris? <laughs> I don't think anybody should ski. Yeah, <laughs> Healthy I, mean, knees, any knees. I think that's a, it's a great question, but you know what? I get asked a lot not to, to divert that question back to you or to back to the panel or actually back to myself is I get asked a lot, should I run and can I run? The answer is no. Think about the loading forces and the ground reaction forces. And so the answer is no. And I, I advise, I have advised men and women to get back to things like pickleball, you know, low grade tennis. They're not trying to be, you know, on the circuit, they're not trying to get back and compete against their neighbor for the championship uh, uh, a thon. But I think the bigger picture is um, you got to take it slowly and you got to take it realistically, but you got to be also smart. You got to be really smart. You can't go back to doing those step class around the world and TikTok. And I mean, I used to do that. I'm a guy here. How many guys could say, yeah, I did TikTok and step class. I've done it. I, you can't do it. Even my knee now, I'm just like, you know what? No. So I think it goes back to, you gotta, you gotta keep living like Rob said, but you gotta be very careful and modify. And his success story is really unique. Definitely. Yeah, that's great. All right. Um, Kim, what's your biggest success story? 
Well, I have two amazing ones I want to share quickly, but I got to just warn you, Chris, do not say the pickleball in Florida. I get so <laughs> many injuries with pickleball. They are hardcore here with yeah. pickleball. They want to take each other out. Um, <laughs> but anyway, that's how I uh, tore my, that's how I tore my meniscus. I skied all <laughs> winter, double black diamonds. Okay. Wow. Double black diamonds. I go, I play one pickleball in the wrong shoes in the running shoes and it's like my foot sticks in place and my upper body was torquing and it did it was not a happy knee anyway go ahead please. yeah so one woman flew to me from ohio just looking for general wellness and healing she had a thyroid issue just wanted to learn how to treat her body better but when she came in she used walking poles and her hips were definitely in a really bad position. But when she came, it took her, we, I said, look, we're gonna learn to see how, if you can get on and off the floor, but this was for, for a specific purpose. It took her eight minutes her first time to get off the floor. And in under a week, we got her down to 30 seconds, which was amazing. But she lived in Ohio, I was here. She could only stay here a week and a half. She did get a double replacement. She came back down after she got through PT. We did an advanced training program. So now she just came back. It's been three years since the double hip replacement. No walking poles. She no longer needs to use the handicapped tag. She is literally 72 years old. She's just amazing. She's uh, reversed her osteopenia, osteoporosis. It's been awesome. So to see her with the double hip replacement, but learning how to treat her body like a gift and then having the right training program for her body. Now she's she feels better than she did like six, seven years ago. And well, then the other did, one. Did, uh, no, I do want to hear the, I definitely want to hear the other one, but she got a double hip replacement. They did them both at the same time. Usually they do one and then the other. Yeah. You know, I can't remember for sure if it was at the same time. I, I believe she actually did do hers at the same time, but I don't want to misquote information. I'll mm -hmm. send you guys in those words. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, but it, since she wasn't right up the road, I didn't get to be as close with her journey as I normally am. Uh, and the other woman, the reason I think this is important to share, because we can sometimes write people off based on their diagnosis or past treatment. This woman had had uh, radiation on her femur due to bone cancer years prior. And, you know, we're told once radiation, the cells are dead. And sometimes people might have an issue with cell renewal. Well, she had a knee replacement and a rod placed in her femur and the bone tissue was not healing well around the rod. So she was having to utilize a wheelchair or a uh, walker. And she was referred to me by someone at her church that had come off of a walker. And she came in and sure enough, I found out the biggest issue why she wasn't healing was that she wasn't getting enough nourishment to heal the tissue. So the physicians did a great job. The surgeon did a great job, but she was trying to live off like 800 calories a day at 73 years old, probably 180 pounds. So as soon as we worked through making sure her muscles were working correctly and that she was nourishing her body effectively, literally within eight weeks, two thirds of the bone healed. And within the next couple of months, she was completely off the walker. She's still doing amazing several years later. And that is after radiation in that area years prior. It was absolutely amazing. Yeah, that's, that is, that's, that's incredible. Um, now, what I'd love to do is get some practical advice. Like, Matt, what exercises should be performed to strengthen surrounding muscles and increase range of motion? Um, that always depends on what the joint replacement was. So whether it's the shoulder, hip, or knee, I, we can pick and choose from there. But uh, just a general blanket statement that can kind of cover all of those. Um, I personally love doing isometrics after the fact. Um, not only is it lower load and stress on the actual body, but I, I love using isometrics as a teaching tool, um, whether, whether you're injured or not. <laughs> it, it'll expose what's happening versus what you expect to happen. Like when people do a single leg bridge, for example, um, some people, whatever, they might look it up online and they might have heard that it works your butt and your hamstrings, but in their mind, if, if, if you ask somebody, oh, where do you feel this exercise? They'll just say, oh, I, I feel it in my, you know, I feel it in my glutes. Whereas they might not actually feel it in their glutes. So whether you're dealing with shoulders, hips, or areas, any muscles around the knees, I think using an isometric can definitely expose what's happening. And 
if they don't feel it where they're supposed to be feeling it, then we can work from there. Like, what, what do we need to cue? What do we need to fix? What do we need to look at? Are we missing anything? Um, so we can work with them on that process because it's not just doing the exercise. Again, if it was that easy, that would be great. But that's part of our, our role as well as, as the fitness professionals to help guide them and make sure they understand. Um, somebody had added that we're, we're here to empower them and be a part of this process with them. Um, it's not just like, here you go, you're thrown into the deep end, sink or swim. I mean, we're gonna be there to help keep, keep people afloat. So isometrics, I think, is a great way to start. I was muted. Sorry about that. My dog started scratching at the door. And Robert, you keep looking to your left I'm <laughs> or right or whatever, and I know it's your puppy. Yeah, oh. and, and my two screaming kids. So the whole crew is here now. <laughs> it's a relaxing environment. Working, exactly. You know, yeah. Um, what tools are you using? Uh, so I, I really like, especially in the beginning, in the first couple of sessions I'm going to get with a client, I like to do a deloaded approach, um, which will use super bands. So I like these, the 41 inches. Uh, you can get these anywhere, Perform Better, Rogue, Spry, uh, Power Systems, they all have them. And we'll anchor from different heights. I have, uh, you see my red one I have hanging up behind me here. We have just, uh, you know, eye joints you can put into uh, the studs above or the top of a squat rack, whatever you want. And we'll, we'll have our clients hang on to that band while they perform a sit to stand, um, while they perform a standing hinge, while they do a drop step lunge, while they do a step up, um, what, whatever it might be where they're going to work through a range of motion where the, the deeper they get into a range of motion, the more vulnerable or maybe the weaker they are, the band will support and kick in and, and take some of that load. And then when they get into some more stacked or more stable positions, a little bit more upright or taller in range of motion, the band will go slack and more of the load goes onto them. And we'll introduce that for, you know, two or three sessions and then eventually kind of work that band down to a very light band, if not no band. And then we'll be able to start to progress up with adding resistance to it. So that's uh, an overall approach for me that I like to take um, one, one or two other tools. Uh, we have something called a T-Bell, not to, to promote other products. I don't have any financial returns or ties to any of these. Um, but the T-Bell is basically, it's a genius little tool that you can add. Uh, it's a it's a, basically a PVC pipe, a loadable PVC pipe that you can adjust the height of the handle on. So it's like an adjustable height, an adjustable loaded kettlebell. So you can raise it up to 20 inches, 18 inches, 16 inches. So clients that aren't quite ready to hinge all the way to the floor or squat all the way to the floor, you can control the height. If you don't have a squat rack, something like that, where you're going to pull from different heights. And then uh, the tank, the tank M1, that's this big beast that's behind me here. This thing, uh, I had to talk my wife into getting this, but it has drastically changed the quality of service that we offer our clients. Those clients that come in, my average client's 71. So I have clients that are coming in with either really poor gait due to knee or hip injuries. Most, most of my clients are hip and back injuries and <clears throat> they're either pre-surgery or come in post and they've got these tight, small little, little gait steps that makes them so unstable and they're reliant on a walker or whatnot. So now I can put them onto a sled that won't shift and slide from side to side. It's only going to go straight. It has controlled tensions to it. So basically it's a loaded walker. They can be stable and work in these great ranges of extension through their hips, through the knees. They don't have to worry about falling down. We can push it, we can pull it, we can row it. Um, they can drag it behind them. And I mean, it's, it's such a cool piece, um, but there's really nothing else out there like that. It's got a magnet resistant, you know, tension to it. So it doesn't slip. Um, it's, it's like a dream piece. And as soon as I found that and we got it here, it's, it's changed so many uh, training sessions for my clients. What? What specifically is it? Is it the black thing on the floor you're yeah, pointing to? Yeah, it's this to? guy. Can you, can you see that there? Yeah. What does it yeah. do? So it's, oh, it it's looks the, like it's got weights on it. Yeah, it's got some plates on there, but basically it's a uh, magnetic tension based resistance sled that you can push. So as we adjust, clients can push through here and work through extension. And this, as with other sleds, they will shift from side to side or slip on the carpet. 
and I can adjust from high tension to low to medium to neutral to where it'll just roll and I can sprint with it. So we get a client that has a really poor base and they're not capable of moving around very well. Instead of holding their walker, I can have them on here and they can work through different extension. They can lower their hips and reverse drag. We can hook a band up behind it where they can push with their upper body and pull it, push with their upper body and pull it. We can hook a harness to the back where they can walk forward and drag it behind them. I mean, it gives us a lot of variety in terms of gait variations, extension training through the hip, and stability. I don't have to worry about them falling down unless they let go of it. So it's, it's really like a dream come true piece. I saw Brian Shaw, the world's strongman, training with the big brother version of this. And as soon as I saw it, I'm like, oh, that's, look how stable this is. Like, I wish they made a smaller one. And I went to the website and there it was. Yeah, so it was, uh, it's expensive. <laughs> I'm not, it's like $900. It's expensive. But, but it's a it's push fantastic. and it does those, the, 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 some of the most valuable actions, the push and the pull. The $900, I mean, I know it sounds expensive, but if you think of it, the treadmills, you know, six, 6,000, you know, yeah. it's or more. I mean, if you're yeah, getting a good exactly. way, one of the good ones, yeah, yeah. depending if you buy like, you know, 15 of them. Yeah. So interesting. That's very valuable. Kim, what type of, um, of equipment are you using? And Robert, thank you for showing, thank you for showing that. That's yeah. really interesting. And of course, as like Chris would allude to, this all depends on what phase of the healing process that they're in as to what we will actually do. I know it's, he's like, I don't know if I do that right away. No, so uh, I like, uh, I use some bands from FMS, uh, Gray Cook, his functional movement systems, and then super strong bands. I also like using the stability ball based on their previous familiarity with it and how comfortable they are, where they might roll out and put their back on the ball and do hip thrusts with their back on the ball and you know the shoulders up. That way they're working their lumbar stabilizer, strengthening the hip, strengthening the knee, again, depending on how they're personally feeling. I may also even have them do some kneeling on a BOSU to work on some stabilization, make it a little bit more fun. Again, that's only if it's maybe more of a hip replacement than a knee replacement. And of course, you know, just single leg stance, simple things too, just to get their balance going. But if I was looking at supporting the soft tissue and the muscle length tension, I really, and again, I'm just like, uh, Rob, I don't, I don't, I'm not affiliated with any of these people, but I like the Moji muscle massager. I love how that gets into the fibers to help the client release any trigger points in their quad or in their um, calf muscle. And then years ago, I don't know if they're still at SCW, but they got the Myo Buddy that helps a lot with loosening the tissue around the surgery or above and below. And again, this is just teaching the client what they can do for their self-care. And I don't know if any of you have used this before. I'm sure Chris may have, but I really love like a slant board. I use an Agoscu slant board. It's got like a 35% grade to stretch the calf muscles because, you know, if they have asymmetry on one side and one calf is tighter than the other, it can change the positioning of the femur and the hip socket create hip hikes and all that good stuff. So I really try to teach them supporting tools to help on the tissues that might be too tight, having issues post-surgery, and then definitely try to get creative with, you know, our stability balls, BOSUs, everything that most trainers have available to them nowadays. Well, that's very helpful. And, and Chris, I know we're getting close to time, which is like, how did it fly by? No but oh what, what type of equipment do you like? No, I was going to say, I'm, I'm jealous. I don't have all those fancy toys. <laughs> <laughs> these guys have just talked about all these fancy toys. You know, honestly, and I'll be very serious. I think they all have practical applications. They all have practical uses. And, and what Rob's talked about and what Kim said, we use TheraBand in therapy, but TheraBand, as you know, has what? It has a lifespan. It's only going to stretch so far, but the consistency and the load is not going to be consistent. So I tend to stay away from doing post-therapy, post-rehab with TheraBand. And I do a lot of tubing. Um, I use TheraBand initially, then the tubing. And then I actually, like Kim, like Medicine Ball, I use the half rolls. I do a lot of balance work on half rolls, tandem stands, diagonal stands, and multi-directional training where you're placing a a tubing or a band, or even one of those like bands that Rob's has of 41 inches around their waist and doing uh, like a step touch with a lateral step or a force forward. So I think the, the bigger picture is use the right tool for the right job, but sometimes there's not one right tool, there's multiple tools, but base it on science 
and ba- I love what Kim said. Kim just really made me tickle pink inside me. Was it's based on tissue time, healing time, but also again, what can the patient do that's safe? So that's my short answer to the bigger picture. All right. So we got all sorts of things. We've got isometrics. We've got expensive things that you should only ask your spouse permission to purchase. <laughs> <laughs> you should use the stuff you already have, like your stability balls, et cetera. Simple, simple tools. I, I love all this. I think this is great stuff. I can't thank you guys enough. Um, I'm, I am not going to run. Thank you very much. But I do play pickleball and I ski. So I guess I'll injure myself some other way and then we'll do another webinar. It'll be great. So hang on. I got to show you a quick video here. Um, Here we go. This is our Active Aging Summit, which is happening in July. I'm so excited. These people are presenting with us. Just thrilled. And you guys get to watch a wonderful video. Wonderful. Be sure to check out our Active Aging Summit. We've got a really fun convention that's also virtual. It's going to be online in August. Um, This is our functional trainer. This is a little more aggressive. It's for those those skiers. It's for the skiers. I want to thank you guys. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Matt. And I want to thank Adam for helping us run run this, um, not run, <laughs> run this webinar. Thank you all for joining me. I'm Sarah, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sarah. Have a good night.